from PB Skinner. Um, she attended our meeting last month. Um, I checked her references. She comes with good education, good volunteer experience, and I think she'll make a good um, council member. So I would like to appoint her to the council and would like to ask the council to make a motion to approve her. And if you want to make it easy, you can just uh, approve the, make a motion to approve the resolution. I made the application, so I will move to accept the nomination or the appointment. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. So, if I may clarify, the res it's a, a motion to approve resolution R212207, Council City appointment for PD Skinner. Is that appropriate? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, then I'll call the question. We start with Councillor Bradley. Aye. And we'll go to Councillor Bagano. Aye. Councillor McGilvery. Aye. Councillor Madison. Aye. Okay. Councillor Skinner, would you please stamp up here? <laughs> Raise your hand, please. I, Phoebe Skinner. I, Phoebe Skinner. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To support the Constitution and laws of the United States. To support the Constitution and laws of the United States. And of Oregon. And of Oregon. And that I will, to the best of my ability. That I will, to the best of my ability. Faithfully perform the duties. Faithfully perform the duties. Of city councilor. City councilor. During my continuance therein. During my continuance therein. So help me God. So help me God. Okay. 
you. You may yep. sit right here. And I realize we're a little cozy, but we both have masks on, so we should be fine. <laughs> and if you need to get your stuff over there, feel free to go grab it. And there's your painting. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We now have a fourth person to vote. So may the record show that counselor or position number four is no longer vacant. And that counselor scanner is present. And it is 6.35 p.m. Okay, the next item is the Gold Beach Main Street update and they have an illness. So you're not gonna be attending tonight. And we do not have a consent calendar. And the next up is a citizen requested, requested item um, for Red Fish Rocks Marine Reserve. And Tara is here to speak with us about that. And I remember when the Marine Reserves were first introduced and nobody wanted them except for Port Orford. So I'm really kind of excited to hear um, how things are going. Awesome, well good, I'm glad, uh, glad you're excited to hear it. Thank you guys so much for giving me a little platform here. Um, and how should we do this um, presentation with the slides? You do have slides you want to share? I do. I do, and I shared them with Jody. Okay. They are in the packet. So if you want to just, um, you know, just go through the, just say we're on slide number one, um, because I don't, I'm always hesitant to do the share screen when the thing's up there because I don't want to lose it. Sure, no problem. So they have copies of them in their packet. Okay, great. Um, I'll just uh, go through my little presentation here. All right, so my name is Tara Ramsey, and I work with the Redfish Rocks community team. We're an, a community organization up in Port Orford, and we do kind of events, activities, outreach, and education around uh, the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. Um, so we've been around now for 10 years, which um, we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year, getting some um, activities and events planned for this year. So we wanted to put that on your guys' radar, um, as well as just kind of talk about the, you know, the good that we've been doing in our community and you know, extend um, an offer for, you, for anyone <laughs> to get involved or for further involvement um, south of Port Orford. Um, all righty. So a little bit of context, we're on slide two now, um, for just why kind of um, marine reserves are important right now. Um, the UN has declared it the decade of ocean science, and, and there's a global network of marine protected areas, which is crucial for scientists to help understand what's ha happening on a global scale. Um, so it's not just you know one marine reserve acting alone. We're a network of marine reserves um, studying and monitoring um, areas of interest globally. And currently, less than 3% of the world's oceans are protected. And there's still just a lot that we don't know. So there's so much happening in the oceans, so much changing, and we've only um, explored uh, approximately 5% of the world's oceans, um, and 94% of living species on Earth are aquatic. Um, so I kind of went in, I'm on slide three now. Um, why are marine reserves important? Number one, they are living laboratories. So up here in Port Orford, um, we have a really good relationship with um, Oregon State University and uh, ODFW. And both of those entities help us study the marine reserve. Um, we uh, follow fish movements, um, amongst other things. We watch populations. Um, so there's a lot of science happening in the marine reserve. Um, and it allows science scientists to take a look at you know, what's happening without the factor of um, kind of human development and taking of marine reserve um, species. Um, so, and it is a long-term investment in a more sustainable future for local fisheries. We really do pride ourselves in Port Orford um, for working with the local fishing fleet. They did propose, you know, where the reserve would be um, at Red Fish Rocks, and we definitely haven't forgotten their involvement. Um, so, it is in the long-term investment in keeping our fisheries around for future generations. Um, marine reserves boost tourism um, and connectivity. Um, the last thing there is, again, that kind of global network of marine reserves, including along you know, the entire west coast. Um, we're one of many, and we can monitor fish movements, um, fish that are tracked. We can see them moving 
in and out of marine reserves along the coast, and that helps us study kind of the overall picture of ocean movement as well as other things like ocean acidification and just creates a network for scientists to communicate. Um, I'm on slide number four now, Oregon Marine Reserve Program. So you guys seem familiar already with kind of the process of making these marine reserves um, back in 2012, but it was a long time coming at that point. So we are one of five in Oregon, and we're one of the first redfish rocks was established in 2010, um, but Cape Falcon is the furthest north, followed by Cascade Head, Otter Rock, Cape Perpetua, and then southernmost is Redfish Rocks. So, all right, I'm on slide number five now, which is a map um, of the area depicting kind of where the marine reserve is, um, just south of Port Orford. It covers um, 2.6 square, square miles, just off of the intertidal zone, out to the um, rock islands, which um, are the, I don't know, the view is known for. Um, and it includes a bunch of different habitats, including intertidal habitat, boulder fields, emergent rocky islands, kelp forest, rocky reef, and sandy bottom. So that was part of the reason why this area was selected, is it has a great variety of biodiversity and different habitats. And it's also connected to the marine reserve is the marine protected area. So the marine reserve is a no-take zone and the protected area um, fishing of Dungeness crab and salmon is permitted, but ground fish are still protected in that area. All right. So next slide, number six, the Redfish Rocks Community Team. We are a nonprofit organization um, and we're a diverse coalition of community members, including scientists, fishermen, business owners, educators and volunteers um, with the mission of supporting Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve through education, interpretation, and marine uh, stewardship opportunities. And we've evolved a lot over the years. Originally, we um, hosted you know, monthly meetings in the community to talk about you know, issues that people, um, citizens would bring to uh, attention or talk about ocean science. And kind of since I mean, the pandemic and everything, we've evolved to now we're kind of creating content and virtual opportunities um, and growing our network in that way as well. So here's a couple examples of our community engagement activities over the years. Interpretation plays a huge role in what we do. Um, we do have a volunteer program um, where volunteers would stand at the Porter River Visitor Center and just interact with the public and talk about the Marine Reserve, our history, our involvement with you know, the different community entities. Um, in Port Orford and also just talk about marine science. We also do educational programs and lots of family-friendly events. We're doing a beach cleanup as well this coming Sunday, if anyone's interested. Um, but we try and keep everything yeah, family-friendly. We've done lots of events for kids. We also created some a children's story recently, um, which we're um, bringing into Port Orford schools to talk about the animals that you can find out at the Marine Reserve. And we also have lots of citizen science opportunities. Um, here you can see, or I guess <laughs> in the, the picture you can see my friend Maddie. She's taking a picture of a tide pool. Um, every summer we do something called a bio blitz, which is an attempt to take a snapshot of biodiversity in an area. Um, so you, you're trying to basically find as many species as you can. and uh, through an app called iNaturalist, this is connected to scientists who can then have a better understanding of not only the biodiversity of the area, um, but also the health of the species, because they, um, they can tell from the pictures, you know, if the starfish are looking healthier, etc. If we're seeing more sun stars, um, which is an important one right now. Um, and then the science at the reserve is obviously crucial to who, um, to having the reserve. We have to study it and we have to know what's going on out there. So some of the big things going on out there are the ecological monitoring programs. We recently had some OSU scientists out. Um, they were tracking fish movements during the Cascadia, the um, blasting of the Cascadia subduction zones because they wanted to see how crab and ground fish would react to those seismic blasts. So we're still waiting to hear what their research concluded. We also with ODFW, um, do human dimensions research within the community. 
And we have, as mentioned, a big Oregon State University connection. Um, so they, you know, are, they bring scientists in all, all summer long, but also all year long. Um, so they do PISCO, which is the group of scientists that actually first discovered the sea star wasting issue and brought it to attention across the West Coast. So we're involved with that and we have volunteer opportunities through that. Um, scientists also work on fish recruitment, um, acoustic telemetry, which is how we monitor the movement of fish at the marine reserve to see if they're staying around, do they move around, <laughs> what are those fish doing. Um, we also monitor ocean acidification, and we have the OSU Field Station, which is an educational place where students can come and learn about the ocean. We also have an intern every summer who comes and joins us, which is lovely. Um, all right, next slide, looking forward. So we asked the question of what is the future of marine stewardship in Oregon? Um, with an ever-changing climate, it's more important than ever to understand marine ecosystems. And we also want to do our part to like translate the scientists that is hap or the science that is happening at the marine reserve to our community so that people see the utility of having this area protected. Um, yeah, <laughs> our goal is to inspire the next generation of ocean stewards as well, hence the educational programming, community, community outreach, and just being kind of an open door um, to talk about the science and inspire people to get involved. And we have lots of opportunities to get involved. As mentioned, we do the BioBlitz every summer. It's a super fun opportunity to go tide pooling for science. Um, we also have something called a junket tour, um, which we created during the pandemic. It's an audio tour that leads from the Port Orford Visitor Center down to the fishing dock, and it's narrated by local experts within our community, including fishermen, um, fish processors, recreational users, and tribal members. Um, we also do coastal bird monitoring, um, youth outreach in our libraries and schools, and interpretation, so if anyone wants to volunteer, reach out. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter um, at the link provided, and we also have social media. And that is my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have them. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, I don't have any questions, but um, we find it goes really quick if I just go through the list. Uh, Councillor Brett? No questions this evening. Councillor Bagana? I don't have any questions. Councillor Skinner. Um, Ms. Ramsey, I actually did have a question for you. I actually teach up in Fort Orford as well. And I was wondering um, about out, you're reaching out here to the city of Gold Beach. Have you guys been talking with the city of Bandon too? Have you been reaching down up and down the coast? Yeah, that's definitely our goal. We have, um, I mean, we have yet to kind of reach out and expand, but that's definitely part of the reason that we're kind of trying to be more visible, um, yeah, up and down the coast, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councilor McGilvery? Um, no questions at this time, thank you. Councilor Madison? I have none, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tara, for bringing this forward. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you need awesome. Thank you guys so much for your time. Really appreciate it. If you need an introduction to Mayor Mary and uh, Bandon, let me know. Awesome, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next up on the agenda is citizen comments. Does anybody have a comment? Put something in the chat, say yes, and I will recognize you. Okay, we'll move on to resolution 212208 possible local option levy for the fire equipment. I'm guessing this is going to be a meaty discussion. Yes. <laughs> um, Where do we want to start? Okay, so let me just like give a little uh, background for, I mean it's in the packet, but let me just give you a little background. So since, uh, and I went in the other room and changed my glasses, oh my gosh. Okay, so um, since 1989 we've had a series of serial levies for um, fire capital equipment. So the property taxes that, that we pay in the city, those fund public safety, which includes the fire department and 
uh, law enforcement, but to buy large capital equipment like the fire trucks, um, we don't have enough money to do that. So years ago, they decided the best way to do that was through a series of, of levies. So typically, what they did um, until, I want to say 20, whatever the one was before 2013, it used to be $40,000 a year, and then it went up to $60,000 a year. And basically, that's just an assessment. And I, I put some of the math in there about what that means, and um, I took on page 33 of the packet, um, that's the tax rate, the 3-1, that's the taxing um, district for within the city limits of Gold Beach. And so if, like, if, a, if a typical citizen looks at their tax bill, they're going to see all of those things on there. And so the, the city GB local option currently for this tax year, according to the assessor's office, is basically um, about 21 cents per thousand of assessed value is what it takes to get to that 60,000. So this year, this assessment that, that just went out in November was the last year of the seven-year levy that was approved in 2015. So um, in order to meet filing deadlines to be on the different um, election calendars, there are certain times that we have to meet. And so in order to be, and this, this is a council decision, I'm just, I'm throwing this out there to you. This is you guys to decide if you want to do this. Um, we have to uh, approve a resolution calling for an election, and then there's certain things as the election officer, I have to do paperwork with the county clerk in order to make that happen. But in order to do that, we have to approve something tonight because by the time the next meeting comes around, um, the filing deadline for the primary election will, will be over. And Madam Mayor knows a whole lot more about politics than I do, but typically um, levies do better in the primary than in the general election because usually there's a lot more stuff on the general election in November. So um, for our purposes for the levy over the years, up until 2013, they were always slam dunks. It just was just a given. And then in 2013, um, it didn't pass. And it was like, what? So that was kind of a shock. Um, so we had to do a little more outreach for the, the following, and it actually failed again the next year, but only by less than, I think it was like 32 votes, something like that. But the kind of the weirdness of it is that staff, and that includes the fire department, the fire volunteers, the fire chief, me, we can talk about it until it becomes a measure. So once the county clerk's office assigns it a measure number, then we are prohibited by state law to discuss it any longer. But the elected officials, you don't have the same prohibition that government employees have. And so that's where we can provide you with all the information, but it's really the, um, the elected officials that have to get the information out there. Now we can put, and we did the last time, we can put something in the water bills before it becomes a measure, but once it becomes a measure, we can't, um, because again, we're in the front office, we can't appear to be in favor of or against the measure that's on the ballot. And there, it, it's not like a huge major deal, but there have been people in the past that have gotten in trouble, um, government employees, for appearing to be either in support of or against a particular measure. So we have to be kind of careful there. But for the last election, um, Councillor Campbell and Councillor McVeigh, they really got out there and you know, they would talk to Rotary and talk to the chamber because it was kind of still going then, and um, the senior center. So it's just, I think a lot of times people, they see our equipment and they go, oh yeah, we're doing great things. Well, it's like, okay, we're doing great things because of the citizens. It's not that the city has some secret pot of money that we fund the fire department and our equipment with. Now, I will say that, and I included in the, re in the council packet that report that, um, Chief Krieger had put together, which is really valuable. And Councillor Bradley had said last year that we should shorten that to put it into the water bills. And we had started on that, and I need to ask in the front office where we're at on that, because we did actually, we're gonna make it like a trifle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And last time I remember talking about it was in November, so I need to talk to Kim and see if we actually did do that. But even if we had, we can send it out again. But that's just good information to get out to the citizens about, okay, this is the equipment that's available. And then these packets are left online too, so people can go look at it. But 
Chief Krieger does an excellent job of explaining what our department needs, how, how we can meet those needs, what's the best way, and um, yeah. So anyway, so for the election, you guys as the governing body have to decide, um, do we want to go forward with putting it before the voters? Um, and if the answer is no, then we don't need to talk about it anymore. But if the answer is yes, then we do need to pass the resolution tonight calling for the election. And then, then that sets into motion other things. Thank you. I'm ready to make a motion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Madison? I make the motion that the council adopt resolution R2122-08, a resolution of the city of Gold Beach, County, Oregon, to submit to the voters of the city a measure concerning a seven-year capital project's local option tax for fire capital equipment and to call an election. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And, okay, let's check for discussion. I'll we'll start with Councilor Bradley. Mm -hmm. I know long term I'd like to see if there's a way we can fund them that isn't through property tax, but I know that we don't really have time to explore that, so I mean my vote is gonna be in eight pay and I but Okay. Dr. Vaughn. Um I would is there a way we can get those if, if they haven't been made, if the trifold type things, the brochure things, can we have those made where the counselors can actually hand those out, go door to door type thing. Oh, absolutely. Is that something that we can do? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's a great idea. Thank you. Counselor Skinner. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> more. Uh, the spot. I just go in order, yeah. voting order, in case you're wondering. Uh, yeah. Counselor McGillivray? Um, I am in agreement with Counselor Bradley. I, I think. Um, we're going to have to get a lot of money of this out of, out of uh, property taxes, but I think we need to start exploring ways to draw revenue without um, increasing property taxes at the very end. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Councilor Madison, any comments? Discussion? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first is uh, the materials and information provided in the packet of regarding the topic. Are we, as uh, counselors, uh, free to use of that information in um, kind of marketing this um, option? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Great. And then the other question I had is, what is the deadline for the motion or for the item to be filed versus cycles that we have available to put uh, that on the water bill? Like how many how many rotations of that water bill do we have to take advantage of before that is a, no longer an option? Um, probably next month because I think once I do the part um, by the end of the month, the, the filing deadline for me to do my stuff with the clerk's office, I want to say is February 25th. Um, and then I don't know, I can't remember because it, it comes up you know, every seven years, so I don't remember. <laughs> Um, but I think it takes the clerk's office a little while to assign the number, or maybe it's closer to the election before they assign the number. So I want to say that we have like like four to eight weeks, and that's that. Just that staff can't do that. Um, so so we if we want to get it out in the water bills and and just uh, Councilor Madison, I'm going to segue real quickly over to what um, Councilor McGillivray said about the the additional property tax. What the the sell was, and this is for all of you, what the sell has always been in the past is that this isn't going to increase anyone's property taxes. This is, we've had these levies since 1989, it's just renewing the levy. And so that's the reminder to try to tell people is we're not, the, the tax that you're paying currently, you've been paying for the fire equipment levy. We used to call it the fire truck levy, but we buy things other than trucks with it, so we call it fire equipment levy. That has been on city taxpayers' bills since 1989, so it's not an increase. So that's something that when you're talking to people, you want to tell them that, that it's not an increase. But um, as far as like getting out material for you guys, I can start putting stuff together now so that once the deadline cuts off for where staff can help you, we'll have all that stuff for you then. And then you guys can go out and, you know, 
beat the doors or do whatever it is that you want to do. Well, that's great. Thank you, Administrator Fritz. So, okay, so we have a, like, at least one um, utility bill that we will be able to use that for, right? Correct. Yep. And you put together like the highlights and the details we to kind of um, flesh out. I mean, there's so much good information. I don't think we'll have a problem pulling that, but if, if there was a, a takeaway we could uh, use, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we did. I want to say, and I'll have to look back in because I keep all this stuff from the prior elections. I want to say that we had already put together like you know a two-minute elevator speech for Councilors Campbell and and McVeigh before, just so that you know you when you're put on the spot, you got it all ready and you can answer those questions. And then it's and it is handy that um, Chief Krieger, you know, he's a business owner, so obviously you know people when not necessarily talking to him, but when they go into the businesses, that's something that, you know, the topic's already being discussed. So that's another good thing. So is it, and last question, I apologize. So it, what we were um, putting into motion with the fuel tax conversation, um, I know over the past couple of years, uh, Chief Krieger has shared some really great video uh, with me and um, just from my day job stuff and so I'm wondering if like would be would it be okay if we like put a video a little promo video like can we kind of do that because when they put a face to to something like this it really does um, pull people in close right things um that is an I don't know and I will ask the attorney that tomorrow because I know that okay. in in um in the past the the previous chief hadn't been really one. He didn't really want to be the face of anything. But Chief Krieger is when you talk fire, he's all excited about that. <laughs> so, um, so I don't think he would have a problem putting together an elevator speech. So, um, so I will ask the attorney that. Like, what's what's the fine line on like doing a video or, um, and then maybe we could put something on Mr. King's website too. You know, an informational thing about the levy. So yeah, that that would be great. We've had a record number of calls this year. Um, you know, really just showcasing the, the, and it not being an additional tax, but, you know, a continuum is, I think, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Maxson. Those are really good questions, and I'll talk to the attorney about them. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yes. Hi. I don't know why I'm going to call the City Administrator, right? That's right. There we go. <laughs> um, I was looking at the numbers. So the, the levy that just expired was a $60 million levy half. The last one, not the 2013, but prior to that. But now in 2022, it's still just 60000 The number's staying the same? Yeah, and, and I looked at the math because previously we had said that it would be approximately $0.27 cents per thousand. But I think the reason why the cost is coming down is that there's been additions to the tax base. And the levy is always a set amount. So if there's more people within the tax base, that actually reduces the amount that each each property owner has to pay because they only levy sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So that so they gets, didn't estimate any need for an increase in that amount, the fire department? Well, based and I just took this off of what Chief Krieger's report was, and he was saying the next piece of equipment that they think that they need to acquire is in the range of it looked like it was between like two hundred and twenty five thousand and four hundred. So if we have a seven year levy of sixty thousand, that's four hundred and twenty thousand. So that, that that's where I took that from. I took it directly out of what he was saying what he estimated things would be. So I, I think so. Thank you. But also right now and Chief White and I were talking about that the other day too, is just the cost of things is just insane right now. So we probably wouldn't be able to buy a truck for that today, but hopefully in a couple of years time, by the time that we've started to collect some of the money, the, um, the weirdness in, uh, actually, it, uh, Superintendent Newdall and I were talking about this too, like we needed to buy a, a public works vehicle right now, it just would be stupid, insane, crazy price wise. So hopefully by the time we're ready to, to buy this next piece of equipment that the chief says we need, the price of things will have come down some. But right now it's like a year out like to even order it. So thank you.
thankfully we don't need it right now. But. So in talking about the levy, it is really focused on that piece of equipment uh, that's missing from their lease or their... That's it, the way that he had written the report. It was like, okay, this is what we have. This is where I think we need to be. We've acquired this piece. We've acquired this piece. This piece over here is now what we need to be focusing on. And I and just off the top of my head, I want to say it's a type six, but it's in there. But I want to say that's the next one that he says that we need. Okay. And he's really focused on like in the past, we've always bought engines, and he was the first chief that really came in and said, okay. We have this really expensive equipment to respond to things that we only have about 5% of the time. The things that we, act, we actually respond to all the time, like motor vehicle accidents, beach fires, wildfires, we, you can't use the truck like you see you know, kids playing with fire engines. That doesn't work for that kind of work. And so he was really the first chief that said, we don't really have the kind of equipment we need for this type of stuff that we do. Yeah. And so, that was kind of like a big departure from, from how we've done things in the past, and it made complete sense. Well, that's that why makes, I was going to say that's the great conversation yeah. point when having a conversation about the levy. Yeah. Like you just said, what you showed. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, and I, I will just uh, put in my two cents that yes, it is a Type 6. That's the next major purchase, but there will be other equipment that will make up the rest of that 600000 just in conversations, I know that he's in need of going to be in need of safety. <coughs> I know in conversations we've had, he's going to be needing safety equipment because they have they can, certain equipment can only last ten years, even if it's been in a bag for nine. Once it hits that ten year, it expires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the time that we get done paying off the SCBA loan, that that sewer reserve, we're going to have to buy that it all over again because that's one of those things that I believe is only good for ten years. And it's, and it's good. I mean, it's safety stuff. So it's, it's important. And our call volume has dropped, dramatically increased. Um, and they need to, when they go out to the call, they need the equipment they need to do the right job. And a Type 6 is more the kind that's designed for wildfire, beach fires, those kinds of fires that are pretty, pretty frequent um, in our area. And I think one of our smartest purchases was the, um, the water tender because a lot of the places we help doesn't, don't have water. And for those of you who don't know, um, Go Beach Water Burn Fire contracts with the city to provide the service, and they also give us money as part of the contract to help pay for equipment. So it's a, it's a pretty good deal for both sides. Um, we're not duplicating services, we join together. And a lot of our volunteers come from their district. So it works out pretty good. Yeah, Assistant Chief. Adams? He's yeah, he's in, in the district, yeah. yeah he's so it, it works out really good. Um, so I'm in favor of it, of course, also. And we do have a motion, a second on the floor, and so I think we're ready to vote, so I will call the question. And I'll start with Councilor Bradley. Aye. Councilor Bergano. Aye. Councilor Skinner. Aye. Councilor McGillery. Aye. Councilor Madison. Aye. Motion carries, 5 to 0. Okay, thank you so much, and I will talk to the attorney about um, the elevator speech and collateral, and I will get that to you guys as soon as possible. Okay. All right. Next up is monthly housing strategies implementation update. That's a lot of words. And Madam Mayor, may I, may I ask you to update on this one, because I think you've been talking to, to Matt more than I have. So, um, as I, I just kind of get everybody back up to speed, there was a report done uh, a couple years ago, almost three years now. And from that report, we got a grant from DLCD to implement a good portion of it. And that's going to be called the Housing Action Plan, HAP. And so the, the plan is Angela Planning Group is going to help us draft, create, and go through the process. They, I call it the heavy lifting. They're going to do the heavy lifting on it. Um, so that our staff isn't bogged down with all that, however our staff does have to work on it. Um, and then we'll start having joint council and um, planning commission meetings. Um, it does two things. One, we get to do it together and we don't ever get to spend any time together. Um, the um, meetings will also be more efficient because staff only has to attend one meeting and the public only has to attend one meeting for each section um, to give input because these are, are we, Zoning changes, um, 
planning changes, which do require public input, which of course we want public input. Um, so that's kind of how it goes. It's a little confusing. Um, I keep trying to remember what we're doing and how we're doing it, and I keep forgetting. So if, it, if you see, feel confused, it's okay. We have experts that are going to guide us through. Um, my question um, for the council is, do you want to try to fit this in, these special meetings, into our regular council meeting? Or do we want to have a special meeting set aside? We probably need four of them, I think. Yes, and just as a, a quick reminder, when we did the housing study itself a couple of years back, it went fairly expeditiously, so it, it wasn't like we needed extra time for an extra meeting. And you can always, if it looks like it's going to go long, we can always do that. But, you know, just for the sake of, because I think we all, like, have death by meeting, all of us, you know, in our, in our day lives, um, that I think we'll start the first meeting, and if it looks like things are going to go sideways and we need more time, but I think that we probably can, just based on the work that was done previously. I, I, I don't think that we're going to need a whole lot of extra time, and I don't want to make you guys have another extra meeting for something that maybe we don't need to have an extra meeting. Okay. So I think we should start meeting number one and see how it goes. And then if it looks like, okay, yeah, this is way too much for a regular meeting, then the next time we can schedule a, a, an extra one. Council, if that sounds okay. Council okay with that? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yes. Okay. All right, then we will plan on the first one being March 7th, I believe, which is our regular council meeting. Do we want to try to have those in person or to have them mostly remote? Or we'd have to do a circle around the whole room if we were to be together. Can I say I don't know right now? Okay. <laughs> Last month was the worst month of the pandemic so far, so, so um, I voted no right now, but... If but, in the next um, two weeks you have an opinion whether yeah. or not you want it in person or, or, or remote, feel free to email the administrator your opinion. We're, bo we're good at both, so... Yeah, I mean, we can make it work, but yeah. I, I think we're probably the most efficient group on remote meetings. Um, does anybody have any questions on this particular topic? Comments? Okay. All right, the next one is a notification of a potential dangerous building, and this is um, the Creek County Reporter Building, also known as the Candle Building, also known as the Old Bank Building. Um, I took some pictures of it. I believe those were put in the packet uh, when I was walking by. I noticed that another window was out. And um, I will let you know that one of the fun things about being the mayor is I don't have a, any skin in the game. And as any of you might remember from me being on the council, I don't like dangerous building designations. So I have reached out to um, the, the fellow that has the mortgage on the property. And I'm hoping that we can get some movement um, to try to solve the problem without having to do a dangerous building designation. But that, does, that shouldn't stop you from doing what you need to do in your job. Uh, but just know I'm trying to solve the problem without having to go through an official process. And the issue with the building is it has a clouded title. The company that owns it is no longer in existence, but we do have contact with one of the partners, and there's a pretty significant mortgage on it that hasn't been foreclosed on. So that's why there's a cloud. And administrator, please take it away. Um, well, as the mayor said, um, this is something that uh, for, I think a couple of you counselors have been around long enough that this topic has come up before. We actually have had a couple of executive sessions about some of the issues um, around the property. Um, we, had, we had actually talked a couple of years ago that we hoped that it wouldn't get here, but um, here we are because the gentleman that has the mortgage that doesn't want to foreclose, he also doesn't want to take care of the property. And so now it's really just gotten to the point where now we do need to do something. Um, I believe the mayor does have um, a line on possibly helping solve the clouded title issue, but that's something that she's doing just like on a political level. It's not necessarily a city thing, but just trying to help facilitate. Um, it, for those of you that don't know, her property management company is Cooperative Management Solutions because Tammy likes to be do things collaboratively. So she is working um, 
to try to, to help resolve that situation, not so much as a city thing, but just trying to help solve problems for people that ultimately will solve a problem for the city. But in the meantime, um, we have gotten to the point where, okay, we now are where it is officially a dangerous building, in my opinion. And that's part of what the code says. If staff, staff goes out, takes a look at it, if we think that it meets the definition of what a dangerous building is by our code, then I am to notify the city council, so that's what I'm doing now. And then the next step, once I notify you, is that it's up to you guys to set a date and time for the dangerous building hearing. Now, the mayor can continue with the um, collaborative approach that she has, and if we get to the, the date of the meeting and we have a resolution, it's sort of like going to court, you go there, it's like we've got a solution, it's all good, we don't necessarily have to have the hearing, but we do need to set the date and time. Typically what we've done in the past is once I notify you, we just put it on the agenda for the following meeting because there are certain notice requirements that I have to do to the property owners. So that's what I need from you tonight is, is it okay um, to put this as an agenda item next month as a dangerous building hearing? All right, council. Uh, I, I say absolutely. Um, Good luck with trying to move forward on stuff, Miss Mayor. <laughs> um, I, I think that if we don't do something about it now, it's just going to sit there and rot even worse, and nobody's going to take nobody's going to take care of it. Yep. So I, I say we move forward on it and do whatever we have to at this point to to get it cleaned up. Do you need a motion? I don't think so. It, well, actually, it, we were supposed to set a date time. A, date and time certain, so yeah, so I guess a motion that we'll have a dangerous building hearing at the next regularly scheduled council meeting. Would you like to make that motion, sir? Sure. I'll make a motion that we have a dangerous building, say it again, dangerous building hearing Hearing um, at our next city council meeting on March 7th. I'll second. Second, second by <laughs> Councilor Madison, I believe. She lit up first. Um, I'll do a quick round of discussion. Uh, Councilor Brett. No, could you speak for themselves? Councilor Bergon. Um, yeah, I just think I think we need to move forward on it. It's not, it's okay. it's an eyesore. It's something that hasn't been taken care of. They know it hasn't been taken care of. The lien holder, the uh, owners, every, I mean everybody. Nobody's done anything with it, so. Councilor Skinner? Uh, Councilor Bergon was my question. So the so the owner hasn't cooperated with the city in the past on moving forward, but they're cooperating independently, looking at possible solutions with you outside of your role. So the that. current owner just wants to give it back to the mortgage owner holder, but the mortgage holder would have to do a foreclosure process. Which is not going to do. And the and current owner, owner and the mortgage person have not been cooperating with the city in the past? Well, the, the LLC that was dissolved Technically, they are still the owner because the gentleman that the mayor has been talking to, the lien holder, has not foreclosed. They actually wouldn't mind just turning it back, but the gentleman that owned, that has the lien has not wanted to foreclose. He wants his money, and it's like, okay, but it's kind of, if they're not going to pay you, you're not going to get your money. I and mean, the timeline says, on this, I, oh gosh, this has been going on for years. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it started... 2010, the, thank you. the town partners won yeah, the business. Thank you. That was the number I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been a really long time. But the, the one of the partners, the other person, we don't, we weren't able to locate them. But they're, they would be happy to work with the city to try to resolve something. But it's... Anyway, so the okay. mayor's working with the lien holder. I think she's made a good, good first stab okay. at it, and hopefully... We would prefer to not, whenever the city has to get involved in dangerous buildings, that means we end up having to spend money and lien the property, and then we don't get it into the property sells. And in a situation like this, where it's, we might not get the money back. <laughs> so, so we try to find other ways to mm -hmm. get it resolved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McGillivray. I, I would have to agree with Councilman Gano, I think it's a it's an eye story and I think something has to happen and hopefully we can get some agreement from the owner of the property to uh, to make a move or 
go ahead and, and go with the lead. Councillor Madison? I'll mirror the sentiments of my fellow councillors. You know, that, that building fits not the first stoplight fit to, um, from the north, of, you know, in town, but it also sits with the hub of what I would consider the historic district of our city. And mm -hmm. it, 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 there's just so much uh, sentiment and um, adoration for that building and so much potential. And I, I just certainly hope that um, there is some resolve in, in um, you know, moving forward and hoping the best for the, the property owners. And however that works out, Mayor, I just want to thank you for going out of your way to help mitigate that. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that's going to help the process, however it ends up. Thank you. Uh, the administrator always said the mayor's like the Queen of England, no power but lots of love, <laughs> and so I'm trying my fun. You have influence. Um, I don't think that's exactly how you worded it, but anyway. Uh, and I, I am hopeful because the market is up, there are interested buyers, so it might be resolved before you have to do what you have to do. Uh, with that, I will call the question. Uh, Councilor Bradley? Aye. Councilor Ronald? Aye. Councilor Skinner? Aye. Councilor McGilvery? Aye. Councilor Madison? Aye. Thank you. Uh, my only request, uh, Administrator, is could you please also include the lien holder on the notice? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Because, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I have the address if you need it, but I think you have it. If it's the same person, yeah, right? It's yeah. the same seat around the address. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You guys are really good at chewing through tough topics relatively quickly. Okay, department update. Chief White. Oh. Welcome. Uh, Mayor Kaufman and counselors, it's a privilege to give you a few months update. It feels like it's been a lot longer than that, but we've been busy. Before I get started, Councillor Skinner, welcome and thank you for joining us in service. This will be my first opportunity to really update you guys, and many of you don't know much about me, but uh, one of the things that, that I would like to share as my focus as we go through any questions or future planning is my prior priority in the legitimacy of the Gold Beach Police Department. And when I say legitimacy of the Gold Beach Police Department, that means a cooperative relationship with the community and with the other partners in public safety and the city to ensure that people are cooperating with us because they want to, not because they have to. And uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to get this done, but in this small community, I've only been more reassured since assuming this position that we have an amazing community of support and we have a lot of opportunities to make a difference. We've, we've got a lot of things going well for us and a lot of work still to do to keep that momentum. Uh, one of the priorities that I've had and will continue to pursue is uh, the training and retention of uh, compassionate, qualified professionals within the department. There's a number of ways to do that. First, we pick the best people we can, but then life happens and being readily aware of everything going on around us in the last couple of years, we can all agree have been a challenge, especially for those of us that work in the field of law enforcement. Even though we generally have an extremely supportive community, we have a lot of folks that still come through our community that may not share the same values and appreciation that the majority that we don't ever deal with have for us. Uh, that being said, we still receive so many people stopping by the PD just to say thank you, stopping us on the street to say thank you. That really helps, including the support of the council, uh, the city administrator, all the staff in our department, making sure that our people do feel appreciated and they know that their work is valuable and important. It does help immensely when we do deal with the few folks out there who would like to throw things at us, threaten us, and, and make our jobs pretty scary. Uh, but we also know that we, st we stand in that gap with training and experience that the rest of the public doesn't have and doesn't want to have to ensure that we keep our streets safe, we keep the folks that might be camped out in one area moving moving along is without, without bullying them or pressuring them, 
um, helping them feel welcome, helping support their lives, um, but also ensuring that everyone else can continue about their life as well. So those are some of the challenges. One of the ways that besides just working with communicating and appreciating the staff we do have is continuing to feed them with, with training and helping them mature in their careers. And one of the things that was initiated before I came in, uh, Sergeant Teeter preceded me by a couple months. He had began to set up training. One of the things Gold Beach hasn't done in a long time, if ever, is be a network of facilitating hosting training sessions. So that's not only getting instructors in-house in some of the more critical components of use of force, taser, firearms, weaponless defensive tactics, but it's also building a relationship with our fellow agencies and the state, which, which he started and we've continued to do. And just in the last few months, we've, uh, he, Sergeant Teeter co-hosted a resiliency training that was partnered with Brookings Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, and Gold Beach PD, was hosted in Brookings and uh, almost all of our officers had a chance to go free of charge thanks to the Hislet work in order to make sure that their paths forward were set in a positive direction and they had the tools to take care of their families through that resilience. Uh, second, the not so fun part, but what gets us in trouble and had new laws passed regarding uh, changes in the taser requirements. We have, uh, he's also a taser instructor and use of force instructor, so we completed a, a new taser, taser update training. Um, we've had firearms training since in the last few months, hosted a field sobriety refresher class with DPSST that the instructor said brought the most number of students that he's had in a class since COVID started. We, draw, we drew in OSP troopers all the way from the I-5 corridor and officers from uh, clear north of Coos Bay and all the way to Brookings. So that, those trainings build community and it build, it's an opportunity to build support amongst our, our members and to share what's working and what isn't working and that's one of the focuses of bringing that training into Gold Beach is to help people see that we are invested. We're not just putting our people out to maintain the requirements. We actually want to help the community of law enforcement up and down the coast uh, have more tools. This weekend, we, uh, and that occurred at the library, uh, building relationships in the community. We have great facilities to do this type of training, and that was where we did that. And then this weekend, we're working with the high school to do a weaponless defensive tactics refresher course, which helps us try to not injure people, that's why, and not be injured ourselves, in the event that we do have to, to go hands-on with an individual. So I'm excited for that and really appreciative of his vision to invest in our officers. One of the other things that we did and I'm extremely proud of because part of my past career was as a deputy coroner, uh, Gold Beach is the only agency in uh, Curry County that has a deputy medical examiner on staff and right now that's our, our administrative assistant, uh, Gail Whitmore and she, we know that it takes time to get up to speed and she's, she's given us that. I'm thinking about five years or around that time I'm going to retire. So we, uh, this, this last few months we were able to get Officer Sarah Amphard, who's got a, a keen interest in these detailed investigations, especially death investigation, um, trained and certified as a deputy medical examiner and that requires cooperation with the state medical examiner's office. She went to Medford got to participate in autopsies, but it's, it's simple to think that a death investigation is just an investigation. It's, it does require similar skills, but the way that you conduct the investigation, especially the way you integrate with the surviving family and loved ones and friends of an individual, changes the outcome of the entire experience. And that's one aspect that is a very critical component of anyone that works in that capacity. But the, the things to look for and the red flags to whiz, when to ask for help, are also very unique. So that training is specialized, it's important, and it allows us, especially with Curry General Hospital in our, in our jurisdiction, for us to have really open, honest, collaborative conversations with medical professionals using their language.
they appreciate that. I know that makes us do our job better and it helps us catch those things that could easily fall through the cracks. So uh, I can assure the citizens of Gold Beach that we, we've definitely gone above and beyond what's required as an agency to provide that level of service and both uh, Gail and Sarah are incredibly kind and compassionate people. And uh, at the same time, uh, Sarah took that on as well as being, you know, we're, our goal is for everyone to focus on a priority. Uh, she also is a, a forensic investigator for child forensic interviewing and also took on a, uh, in the last four months, a, the task of recreating our evidence locker with shelves and organization and an audit to make sure that we're compliant and uh, up to speed on that. So we have a balance of, of like I'd like to say young officers that have been on for that three to five years is a real critical time. There's a lot of enthusiasm but we've been blessed to have a balance of half of our agencies also been in, in law enforcement closer to that 10, 10 years up to, to 20 to 26 years um, with me in, in public safety. So we're a very uh, balanced organization and it's working extremely well. Uh, equipment, we mentioned it earlier with the, the challenges and we did bring in a new car that was ordered last summer. It was expected to arrive in six weeks. Six months later and a lot of phone calls, we did receive that vehicle. It went all over the country before it got to us, uh, but we really needed it. It replaced a 2004 um, Ford Expedition that just sold by sealed bid um, last week. It served us well, but it was worn out, really, really worn out. And with the goal to, to try to have about a 10-year cycle in our cars in this small town, uh, it wears a car out. And uh, we, have, we have good, safe equipment. and. Uh, in a confident working relationship. I'm glad to have the team that we have and I know that I've never worked in a, an agency that I've had have more support and knowledge and experience available to tackle almost any problem that would come up. Uh, mainly I know that City Administrator Fritz does her job night and day and I appreciate her experience in helping make sure that I I, she tells me what I need to know before I need to know it. So, so thank you, and uh, and everybody in public works and the fire department. It's it really is exciting to come to work here and and be part of this team. Any questions? Yeah, Chief White is no. I mean, he tells me all these things. It's like, whoa, I didn't know that. You know, no, he's no. It's the other way around. He tells me exciting things every day. Just a gentle reminder that we official titles in our council meetings from our council rules. <laughs> I would like to share with the counselors, if you don't have any questions tonight, I'll give out my cards. They're, they're up front. They're anywhere. Um, you, I am, whether it's a business owner, somebody that just wants to talk to me, anything else, but especially for you guys, if you want to take a drive to the city and point out things that you see that you have questions about or you want to sit in the office, and just share concerns that you hear or want answers to and what we know what we're doing about it, please just let me know and we will make that a priority. It's a surprise for a lot of folks when they realize that uh, I'll just tell you to get a group of your friends together whether you're in a house or a business and, and I'll come and answer any questions you have. I'm pretty shameless and I don't even need warning in advance. <laughs> So it's been exciting uh, for to go into businesses and they do, when they figure out that that's real, they do bring in more and more people that don't even have anything to do with them, but they had a question, so they invite them along. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead, Councilor. Um, I will say that Chief White will also talk to teenagers in groups if you just bring them into his office. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Citizens of all ages. Yeah. Have you been yeah. doing things with that element? Well, it's you haven't been here during normal times. So I assume when normal times repair, you'll be doing things at the elementary, at the K-8 school as well? Yeah, and I have had, uh, we've had more challenges and opportunities to be involved with the high school uh, since I started. And I know that Sergeant Teeter has had a very active in engagement at the elementary school. And I'm, I'm excited to, to join in that and be more involved. 
one of my early things that I did was start a school resource officer program and am a school certified school resource officer. So I do love to work in the schools and it's making sure that I keep those priorities in focus. Okay. And just Councillor um, Bradley, when he came on, you know, because COVID, normally we would have a tour with the different departments. Um, and now that Councillor Skinner, you're on board. So we will get you in touch with, um, we're going to hear from, from Superintendent Newdall in just a sec here, but in normal times, we would give you a tour. You know, you'd go to see the wastewater plant and all that, you get to talk. So at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to get you to see all the different parts of the, the city. Uh, any other councilor have any questions for the chief? I just have a comment there. Sure. Well, Chief Wayne, I just wanted you to know I, I really appreciate your leadership, your professionalism, and the collaborative approach. Uh, the emphasis of training and decorum invested in your department really has the potential to build a dynamic law enforcement team. And your enthusiasm and your knowledge are a welcome breath of fresh air, and I just really appreciate you for taking the job. Thank you. Thank you for your continued support. Anybody else? Um, I want to just echo what Councilor Madison had to say, but also, are any of the training that you guys do, obviously not like firearm training and stuff, but the how to protect yourself type things, do you, are those, were you open to, um, up to the public and stuff or no? Well, obviously not right now with COVID, but. Yeah, COVID has been a challenge. Before COVID, I actually, when I was still working at the Sheriff's Office, I did group uh, trainings with the school, um, with girls from the basketball team. I had, uh, I did numerous things that were uh, community related. I would love to get back at that because it's uh, invaluable, and especially with the teenagers, it broke down barriers and opened up communication to this day with those young people that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So I do hope that that's something in the future. I will expect that as we take on more community challenges, we will bring people together in a community forum um, to, to get some input in that. Luckily, we're just not at a place right now where that's, that's essential, uh, but it's something that I welcome and value for sure. Awesome. Anybody else? I, I have one more quick question. If mind. Sure. Uh, Chief, Chief White, do you have any feedback or experience in a neighborhood, a neighborhood watch or a next door type program and is that something that you could see that's, um, being implemented here in the future in Wolf Beach? Yeah, that's actually, that was actually something I was just thinking about when I made the last comment. Um, one of my jobs before I became an administrator uh, was a community resources deputy and I, I managed a program instead of calling it Neighborhood Watch because it required a lot of collaboration to really make that program work and it would burn people out. Uh, but really to put together a neighborhood safety program that allowed every level of involvement in a community. So some folks really took it seriously and some folks um, just wanted their number available in case, in case they were out of town and someone wanted to get a hold of them because their water, water was running out of their, their windows, you know. But uh, yes, there is, there's been a lot of that in my past. And it's something that I think Gold Beach really needs to focus on in the, the coming years, so I expect there to be more challenges. Uh, everyone may not know, I know I've spoken on several different levels, but very early in my beginning career back in 1999, I went to counterterrorism school and continued in counterterrorism and domestic terrorism uh, throughout my career. And it was a great opportunity to learn things I wouldn't have known, but at the beginning of my career, so 20 to 30 years ago, if you wanted to keep bad things happening in your neighborhood, you put up motion lights on your house and it drove criminal behavior to the houses that didn't have motion lights. Well now everyone's got street lights up and motion lights on their homes. So the next level today is camera systems. So if you have cameras on your house, they don't want to get recorded. So they'll go to a neighborhood where there aren't cameras. And one of the ways that we can, can easily uh, control some of that in the community is through a strategic camera program 
Uh, not that it's being shared publicly, but it's people that do have that safety emphasis who want to take responsibility for their little their corner or their street and they have that available and they manage that for us and it's a resource that we can reach out to them and it's already being utilized in, in many businesses around town that we know where to go and who to talk to to get video evidence but that's something that we could easily utilize more and with the technology costs coming down as much as they have it's something that uh, I'd like to offer more information to people and I know we have community members that are very knowledgeable and have facilitated that program long before I arrived so I'd like to continue that. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions for Chief White? Comments? Okay, hearing none, I just want to remind uh, counselors um, if you haven't been to the training, if you do want to speak to staff you do have to let the administrator know and technically get her permission. So even though Chief White has opened it up, uh, you got to follow protocol. A little bit like the military. Um, she's never, to my knowledge, ever restricted anybody from doing that. But I've also found, that even when I was a counselor, sometimes if I talked to staff, even as a business owner, I would freak them out. <laughs> so it was always better to let her know and then have her say, will you please talk to this person? So, um, and I would just say, um, and and I appreciate that the mayor has always been very hypersensitive of, of the chain of command, but the, 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 some of the background on that was that in the past, counselors would contact police officers directly and not go through the chief, not go through. And so then there was kind of this very fine line prior to me that was, that was drawn where it's like, okay, from no, but I will say because we have a different kind of relationship with Chief White, he is, you know, I feel sorry for, for Will, he's going to, you know, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> or Will go first next time, because <laughs> it's like, yeah, what are you going to say, Will? Um, but um, if the council members want to talk to Chief White, I don't have a problem with you contacting him directly. I do have a problem with contacting police officers directly, because if you, if you have an issue or, or a citizen brings you an issue, about a particular police officer, whether that's an interaction with a traffic stop or whatever, please come to me first, then I'll talk to Chief White, but please, that's where the fine line is, is like not contacting staff members directly, because it does, like like the mayor said, as a business owner, they some of the people are like, okay, is the mayor talking to me, or is this Tammy Kaufman, the property owner, talking to me, and so, but because, Chief White is so out there and loves to talk to people. You guys feel free to talk to him anytime. You don't have to, to, to talk to me about it first, but please don't talk to the staff unless you talk to the, the chief. Because it does, it does freak out the, the <laughs> underlings. Because they, they, you know, it's like they don't, it, it just freaks people out. So, yeah. And but I, feel free to contact Chief White. I, I believe that Superintendent Middle's predecessor was basically fed up with a council member that wouldn't leave alone. Right, so we but, don't want that to happen again. <laughs> right, but that also that that um, that superintendent was was very that I don't want people to contact me. Yeah. You know, there's a way that there's there's a thing that needs to go through, and you, you need to go through that channel. But yeah, um, yeah, Jordan, you're a hard act to follow. So you know. <laughs> You okay. guys feel free to call him anytime. Anytime. Okay. <laughs> so, with that, uh, Councilor Noodle, you would ask for some time. You have to unmute, though. I got it. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I want to give you a brief update of our two uh, projects that we have going for the water department. Uh, currently, we have Morello Construction on site and constructing for the last three weeks. Um, so far, they've installed 750 lineal feet of water main. And they've been slogging their way through Jerry Splat moving southward on Highway 101. And they are able to achieve, uh, when they get rolling, about 200 lineal feet a day currently coming down the highway. And so that's, that's really good when we're installing a main the size that uh, we have contracted to replace. And so on our other project, which we have, which is replacing the water intake and rebuilding the water treatment plant, uh, we had a meeting that was mandatory last week for pre-construction, and we had 
seven attendees, uh, contractors who are interested in uh, our project, and so we took them on a tour, and they were able to ask us questions about the project, anything under the sun, and they have another two weeks to put together a bid package and submit it to us on 2-22-22 at 2 p.m. And the estimated cost for that project is uh, anywhere from 2.3 to $3 million. And so hopefully we're on the bottom end of that uh, in a couple of weeks. But uh, I'll know more at the next meeting. Because by then we'll probably be putting something in front of you for approval. As long as they dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. But uh, are there any questions? Which ones? <laughs> If not, I will bid you adieu until next month. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, with that, we will go to Councillor Comments, and we always get to start with Councillor Madison. Because that's who's listed first. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. So, first off, I just wanted to kind of recap all the uh, The planning training opportunities that were provided to us and um, thank Administrator Fritz for uh, making that happen uh, so quick. Um, and I think what was most entertaining about that is that those of us that attended uh, got kind of flattered a little bit and talk about our takeaways and, and what we found interesting about that. So that was great. And uh, yeah, the, the first one especially was just tremendous. In fact, we got to stay on for an extra hour in our little breakout session and you know, just talk shop. And so that was great. I just wanted to say thank you, Administrator Fitz, for pulling that off. It was uh, it was awesome. Thanks. Okay, I actually have to, that, you can thank Mayor Hoffman. She was the one, I actually knew nothing about it. She was the one that, that told me about it and said, hey, we need to send this out. So thanks to her. But I'm glad that you got something out of it. That's awesome. I, I think we all did. And thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Always looking out for us. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, it was good training. Uh, anything else? No, thank you. Thanks. Councilor Bradley. Uh, I did have a member of the board member of the Fireworks Fund reach out to me, kind of explain some of the ideas they have, and they wanted to approach the council, so I made sure that they had Administrator Fitz's email and instruct them what to do to talk to her if they want to get on the agenda, so hopefully you'll be hearing from them. Okay. And if, and if anybody ever wants money for public stuff, um, our administrator is actually a tax administrator, so she makes those decisions. So they're if, welcome. If it's the promo money. Yeah. For promo money, um, they are welcome to make presentations to get the word out here mm -hmm. as well. We're, we usually make time for people, but a lot of people don't realize she's the money person. Okay, anything else, sir? No, that's all I have to do. Okay, Councilor Bagana. Um, I don't have anything. Okay, Councilor Skinner. I am looking forward to working with you all and learning. There's so much to learn from all of you, so I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McGilvery. Well, this last month I did uh, attend the fair board meeting. Thank you. Did to become that liaison and. Uh, found it a very interesting process. Um, they're, they're certainly going forward you know, whole hog for the fair, so I think we're going to really enjoy a nice fair this year. Um, the, uh, they're they're uh, struggling a bit with the uh, fence of the fair, and uh, you know, the state of the kitchen, <laughs> the time goes to sleep. So we'll see how that pans out in time. But I do um, plan to continue to go to the peer board meetings, and we'll certainly keep you up to date. Thank you very much. I appreciate you doing that. OK. And I have a really long one, but I promised the uh, administrator I would not read all. So I'm just going to read key points. I even made a little cheat sheet for myself. Uh, of course, February is Black History Month, and racism is still with us. But it is up to us to prepare our children for what they may have to meet, and hopefully we shall overcome Rosa Parks. And one of the things that a lot of us don't realize is that Oregon has a pretty negative history um, with racial 
stuff. And in uh, June 18 of 1844, our provisional government passed Oregon's first black exclusion law. It states that blacks who tried to settle in Oregon would be publicly whipped. 39 lashes, repeated every six months until they left Oregon. In December 19th in 1844, the exclusion law was changed. Blacks who tried to settle in Oregon would not be whipped. Instead, they'd be forced to do public labor. Five years later, the Oregon Territorial Legislature enacts an exclusion law that prohibits Negro mulatto to enter or reside within the limits of its territory. However, Negroes and mulattoes and their children already living in the territory were not subject to this law. Uh, in September of 1851, Oregon's 1849 exclusion law is enforced against Jacob Vanderpool, the only instance of an African American being expelled under one of Oregon's exclusion laws. Um, in 1854, the legislature bars testimony of Negroes, mulattoes, Indians, and persons of half or more Indian blood in proceedings involving a white person. Uh, in 1857, Oregon voters approved the Oregon Constitution, which bans both slavery and new black residents in Oregon. It makes it illegal for blacks to own real estate, make contracts, vote, or use the legal system. I always found it interesting that Oregon was against slavery, but black people couldn't live here. Um, in February of 1859, Oregon became the 33rd state, admitted as an anti-slavery state, and the only one admitted with an exclusionary clause. In 1862, Oregon legislature passes a law banning interracial marriage and institutes a $5 annual tax on blacks, Chinese, Hawaiians, and mulattoes. Those unable to pay had to perform ward maintenance. In 1900, Oregon voters reject a proposal to repeal the legal exclusion law in the Constitution. In 1922, Beatrice Kennedy Kennedy became the first African American woman to graduate from Lewis and Clark Law School. I'd really like to meet that lady. Wow. She's not here anymore, but that must have touched some guests. Didn't you graduate from Lewis and Clark? Oh, Mayor, yeah. I was just making a note to ask my husband, who was an archivist and special collections librarian <laughs> at Lewis and Clark, about <laughs> Beatrice Kennedy. Thank you. The 1926 exclusionary clause is. Uh, in 1926, the exclusionary clause is removed from the Oregon Constitution. In 1951, the law repealed prohibiting interracial marriage. In 1957, Oregon's Fair Housing Act passes. We're moving along. In 1959, the Oregon legislature, legislature ratifies the 15th Amendment 90 years after its adoption in the United States. Um, and then I wanted to mention uh, William Rumley. He was he lived to be about 89, 90 years old in the area. He was the, uh, as far as I know, the only black colored, I don't know the right word, uh, former slave that uh, lived in our area and uh, homesteaded. And I there's things named after him. That that was terribly interesting. It, it was interesting, and I found some different. Um, Articles and you know they have different dates that he lived and different dates he did, that he was around. There is a photo of him, which is amazing, and uh, so I put some history in here. Uh, but he was a slave and he escaped um, from California and came up here and found himself uh, a nice history. Um, he married uh, an Indian woman and they su supposedly have a child, but I can't find anything on the child. So. He made his living um, mining and fishing, and from what the reports are, he was a very easy to get along with guy, and everybody liked him. He's been buried in Oak Flat Cemetery. So that was really kind of a cool one to put together. Um, thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> and um, with that, the administrator has her hand up. I had one thing that I forgot to include in the packet. Um, but I, I don't know if the owl can see it. <coughs> see that? That's a, that's a check for $175,000. Will's, Will's shaking his head. Yay. Um, the, the two projects at Riley Creek School were partially funded through grants from the Oregon Department of Transportation for what's called the SCA, the Small Cities Program. And uh, Due to COVID, things kept getting pushed back, and then we had a hard time getting a contractor, and then there were supply issues, and uh, 
So this, it, this had started, gosh, I think in 2018, 2017, 2018. But um, the work that was done around the school, including the sidewalks, the, the short sidewalk on leaf, the reason why it's short is because that's all we could afford to do. Um, it improved the, um, the roadway there by the school because it was um, breaking up pretty badly there. But anyway, we had two separate grants. One was for $100,000, the other one was for $75,000. So we just got that money a couple of weeks back from ODOT, yay. Um, the overall project cost was um, more like 260000 because part of that was due to COVID too. But at least um, $175,000 of the stuff that was done near Riley Creek was paid for by ODOT. So, yay. Thank you. Um, and it looks like the administrator put in the drop-in clinics for vaccines and testing. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a huge influx of um, COVID in the area, and there was nowhere to get tested because the hospital got overwhelmed. And they do that as a courtesy. They really are not our public health authority. The state is, and so the state has agreed to do some more tests and the dates and times in there. It's Tuesdays, 11 to 4. Uh, Wednesdays 2 to 6.30 at the library for vaccines, and then drive up um, testing is Mondays 11 to 5, and Thursdays 11 to 5 um, at the Great Health Foundation, which is across from the hospital. So, and if you ever have a question on something like that, you can always call 211, and they will have the most common, most common, most current information. But I know there was a lot of question about how do I get tested, where do I get tested, what do I do once I know what's going on, so. And it is my understanding that if you do have COVID, there are medicines out there, so check with your primary care physician if you are positive. Don't walk in, call, and <laughs> they may have a protocol. So, don't be tough, <laughs> unless you have to be. Cool. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to um, close the meeting, but we do have a short executive session afterwards. Um, do we officially adjourn? Or do we? Yes. And and, and, and actually, I don't know if do do we need to have the. Yes, we do. Okay. And I would like to ask the chief to stay, if that would be okay with you. Yes. Okay.